hello. Um, this is, my name is Dr. Peter Hughes. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a consultant psychiatrist here in London. I'm also uh, chair of the London uh, Division of the College of Psychiatrists. Uh, I've been a WHO consultant for many years and most specifically focusing on MH gap in many countries. Um, and I probably see my role as a public mental health specialist. So I thank the organizers for inviting me to talk on this topic, which is using MH gap as a training tool and reflections on 10 years of use. For myself, I've trained, I think I've done about 40 trainings in MH gap around the world and looked at some uh, follow up in many of these places. For me, often I don't get to see what happens afterwards. Uh, so that is one of the limitations of my talk, but I've tried to look at what's happening around the world and give some updates. Um, this is for me where I've been particularly involved with. These are countries that I've been involved directly in MH gap trainings. I've been involved in many other countries as well. And now I'm looking at a project with the uh, Inuit in Northern Canada. Uh, so different cultures. I'm about to do some work with uh, the South Pacific Islands. Uh, so um, increasingly what I do now is supervision. And this is one of the big themes of MH Gap is that you do supervision afterwards to keep it going. So my talk will be about looking a bit about the background of MH Gap, evaluation, and then reflections. Firstly, thinking in the background about the benefits of MH Gap, um, and I'll explain the pro program of MH Gap in just a moment. But this is a way of integrating mental health into primary care settings. So it has the great advantage of being a focus at primary health care. So it's a public health approach to mental health. It encompasses physical, mental, and social, even spiritual. Um, it's using evidence base. It's, I would say, not a Western document. It's got economic advantages in doing it like this, and it's non-stigmatizing and effective. So I'll talk a bit about the criticisms of MH gap. And I think also they can be turned around and looking at advantages. Uh, the pH focus, PHC focus and lack of capacity. I think I'm, what I hear all the time is people saying, I don't have um, time to see people for mental health and primary care settings. What I would always argue is that you can do an awful lot in seven minutes in a primary care setting. The accusation that it's a medical model, and I don't really see this. Uh, this is, um, it's, it's a model that's looking at physical, mental, and social. The accusation that it's Western, I think, is probably unfounded because it uh, covers a range of evidence bases from around the world. Not sensitive to culture, I think, is something that we hear quite a lot. And we work very hard to make sure that uh, we adapt to the culture uh, of any country. So, for example, working with the Inuit in northern Canada, we've got to be extremely as sensitive to their culture. We're looking at how we can use uh, or involve the elders in the community for, for this process. The criticism that it's not sustainable, I think, is a well-taken uh, criticism. It is not sustainable unless there's ongoing investment and uh, energy put into this, that it's tokenistic. And I think that this could be a valid criticism because it has to be MH gap. There has to be a real commitment to MH gap, not just training, but implementation. So here is one of the places where I started, which was MH gap in Uganda. And you can see that the conditions can be quite difficult. There was a shortage of medicines, many people attending a primary healthcare center, but a uh, considerable lack of resources. Um, this is probably another kind of view I would 
want to share of MHGAP, which is about training. And in this case, this is a picture for, of uh, training everyone in a primary healthcare setting on mental health. So the background to the MHGAP program, firstly, uh, it's when we look at leading causes of disability and mortality by 2030, depression is right up there as one of the most disabling conditions. High income countries, middle income and low income. So we really need a way of dealing with mental health problems and particularly depression in um, the world. And there, is n there are not enough psychiatrists to meet that need. Uh, it needs um, MHGAP is one way of addressing this gap. Uh, also in the background is the World Mental Health Action Plan, which tells us that mental health should be delivered at a community base as much as possible. And um, the sustainable development goals uh, also are relevant in the background of MHGAP. Building back better is something I always start with whenever I'm involved in projects around the world, which is a WHO document which gives some stories and messages of hope dealing with how people have um, developed their mental health services, even of times of great difficulty. Um, and I can see that some of an example that I'll give here is Syria, where, where we did training in MH Gap, and it, the program has run very well, considering all, all considering all the difficulties of the war. Um, this, although this is really refers to humanitarian emergencies, I think it gives a good model of what we're looking for in MH Gap or how we approach MH Gap. It's not just about uh, one sector of the health system, like specialized services, are there, though they're a very important part of it. Focused on specialized supports means the PHC generally, uh, the primary health healthcare center, but community and family supports, basic services and security are part of the MH gap model in how we deal with uh, mental health problems. Uh, so physical and mental psychosocial, we're dealing with all of those together. Uh, in the background as well is the Lancet Series on Global Mental Health, which showed that low cost treatments are affordable um, and effective uh, in mental health, that these can be delivered at a primary healthcare center uh, or in the community. Um, but even with all of this, there's a huge gap in mental health provision. And even with all that evidence we have, we still see a lack of investment in mental health and a lack of provision of services, which is one of the aspects of MH Gap is about advocacy and asking for uh, or shouting out for the mentally ill in the community to make sure their needs are met and supporting the mental health to be empowered to demand what they, they, they deserve. Uh, so the gap in MH gap is the gap between need and service. And in many countries, this is extremely high, like South Sudan, the gap will be maybe 99%, whereas other countries, even high income countries will have gaps of maybe 35%. So there's, it's difficult to absolutely meet all the needs of uh, mental health needs, but the gap in some countries in the world is just overwhelming. Uh, so this is another slide just demonstrating this gap between people with mental health receiving no treatment and treatment available. So there's a huge gap in a lot of countries in the world. The mental health gap program itself began um, with WHO in order to address this gap in mental health services. And um, the manuals and the materials have been launched ever since. Um, so it comes at a higher level. It's, this is an old slide. It's now used, MHGAP is now used 
in more than a hundred countries. Um, and it's uh, ministries of health throughout the world are very, very aware of MH gap. Um, and going back again, well, just a little bit about the importance, which I've said already, which really, which is that at a primary healthcare center is where you can bring mental health, physical health together, even um, spiritual and social health together. Uh, so it's a ray of people accessing mental health in a non-stigmatizing way. It's respect human rights, it's affordable and cost effective, and it has good health outcomes. This is the main tool that we use in MHGAP programs, which is the intervention guide. Uh, so this is a manual of how in a primary healthcare setting, you can manage, assess and manage easily most common mental health problems. Um, there's trainings. A lot of what I do is trainings, uh, but there are people are doing trainings around the world. In Pajo, in the Americas, they have uh, set up some online training, um, and that, that's the I've got the link at the end of the slides. Uh, there's also an MH Gap app. Uh, one of the criticisms of MH gap that people will have often, especially doctors, is they'll say that I can't be looking at a manual or a book when I'm uh, seeing patients. Um, but the app on the phone is another alternative. And research has shown that patients probably would prefer people to be looking at an app rather than a book. But in any case, it's a key part of MH GAP program um, in primary healthcare centers that people are actually using the MH GAP in whichever uh, platform they use. So the steps in setting up an MH GAP program, um, I, I won't go into that. But the key things I want to point out are the adaptation that you must adapt to wherever you are taking into account the culture and local situation and circumstances. Uh, trainings, rollout of trainings, and then supervision is a really, really important aspect and evaluation. Here is a slide showing some of the technical aspects of setting up a program of uh, MH gap in a country. It needs to be uh, at a high level to implement and keep this going and to have it part of a mental health strategy. So there's an adaptation process, training supervision, monitoring evaluation, situation analysis, implementation plan, and then it goes back again. And the ingredients, other ingredients that are important are the supply of medicines, advocacy and awareness raising in the community as well. Um, this is another way of, of describing this, the right environment for MH gap is that it's taken on at a high level in the country. It's accepted by psychiatrists who are very, very important as sources of support, uh, referral, uh, et cetera. Uh, human, human rights is extremely important. Uh, psychotropic medication, um, supply is very important and uh, having the right resources. So going back to the MH gap itself, uh, the, I'll talk now about the master chart, the modules and this version. Um, and I, just to give you some other picture, this is MH gap training. So this is in Gaza. And I'm just giving you some examples of different places where we've had programs. Uh, Zimbabwe, um, South Sudan. There are a range of materials available for MH Gap, all on the WHO website. There's PowerPoints, facilitator guides, supervision guides. Uh, there's also a range of videos that are available um, to support the MH Gap uh, training and program. Um, 
So who can do, who uses the MHGAP program? Non-specialist health workers. It's part of task shifting or task sharing, recognizing the great gap in number of psychiatrists around the world. Psychiatrists now um, in the MHGAP program need to be experts to advise, supervise, receive referrals of the more complex cases and refer back. And these are the specific modules that are in MHGAP. Um, when we're doing an MHGAP program, what we'll work first is prioritizing which are the modules that might need to be covered. Uh, the depression is almost always going to be there as it's such a huge uh, common condition and causes such a burden in society. Psychosis is something that in primary care tends to not get missed, probably not treated uh, in the way that one would like. Um, and it's quite an easy win to treat psychosis. But often psychosis cases, uh, people will get diverted to secondary care quite quickly if there is a secondary care. Uh, epilepsy, people might remark, why are we covering epilepsy as psychiatrists or in mental health? But it is a reflection of the lack of neurologists in so much of the world. And we do focus a lot on psychosocial aspects of epilepsy management. Children's, children's conditions are very often missed. Uh, hyperactivity, conduct disorder, emotional disorders. These are common conditions, very commonly missed. And with primary care health services, when there's a limited period of time for, to see everyone, it can be uh, a challenge to pick up children's conditions and a challenge to manage them, especially when you're not looking at medication. Um, doctors are comfortable with medicines, not so comfortable with psychosocial. And it's a challenge in children's conditions to address that and get um, doctors or whoever might be the health worker to be working with families and children, looking at parenting skills, et cetera, other tools of uh, dealing with children. Dementia, a very significant problem in some countries like Saudi Arabia, I was working for recently and dementia was one of the topics they wanted to really focus on. Uh, substance abuse can be very variable in, and uh, country specific. Alcohol can be a big problem in some countries, less in others, but there may be other substances. Um, opiates may be a big problem in other countries. Use of prescribed medicines, tramadol, et cetera, in the Middle East can be a big issue. Self-harm, suicide. Now, this is a huge topic um, that is, sometimes people will see it as a Western condition, whereas in fact, suicide is a very common condition in so many countries. Um, I showed a slide earlier of Zimbabwe, for example, which has a, has a quite a high suicide rate. Uh, the suicide rate in India is, is relatively high, uh, maybe a bit less so in Pakistan, but still the principles of suicide are very important. Then there's the chapter called Other Significant Mental Health Complaints. And this is psychosomatic problems or milder depression, anxiety, stress problems. And here we would also cover uh, conversion disorders. Um, and I know this uh, conference is coming from Lahore and in Pakistan, I've seen many cases of conversion disorders where this chapter would be very appropriate. And in primary care, I think generally what one would see in terms of mental health problems is a lot of medically unexplained complaints forming quite a large amount of the uh, people who come to a primary care setting. Um, I could mention that. Adaptation exercise, I just to emphasize again um, that adapting to the culture was very important. There has been, a, there can be formal workshops about this, or it can be done as one goes along with the training. Uh, so 
implementing MHGAP, prepare well, prioritize the conditions. So you don't have to do all the conditions. You might just say, we'll do depression, uh, chapter other, um, maybe dementia or something. You may just take a small number of conditions rather than covering everything in the initial rollout. But you need to plan your supervision and implementation. Um, essential care and practice is the first chapter of MHGAP which is, uh, covers basic principles. I'll talk about that in a second. Community sensitization must run hand in hand with this. Um, there are other tools available now. There's uh, the operations manual, which can give you a guide as to how to set up MHGAP in your country. And um, I know Dr. Hamayan in Pakistan has, has uh, developed this MHGAP job aid, uh, which is a very practical summarized version of MHGAP that you could use as a desk top aid. Supervision, uh, having a framework for that, very, very important, even before you start. Um, just the training, I'm not going to go into really, but it generally covers about a week. Online, we're covering it a bit longer. So as I mentioned, this first summary chapter, essential care and practice, just giving you a picture of what the... Um, the MH gap does look like. And essential care and practice emphasizes this is the principles to, uh, to implement your M MNS um, treatments uh, and assessment. It covers good communication skills, respect and dignity, and assessing and managing physical, mental, and social health. And spiritual health can come in there as well. So I'll, um, it's compliant with COPD. So you'll see a lot of the marks of Convention of the Rights of Person with Disability there. It emphasizes vulnerable groups. And um, you, you can have a look at this uh, at another stage, because I'm just going to just give you a picture of it. The type of psychosocial treatments are really emphasized. They come first before any mention of medication. So we always talk about psychoeducation, um, uh, stress management and follow-up, vulnerable groups. So the principles of treatment that always are things like psychoeducation is always there, stress reduction, problem solving, psychological first aid, involving families, but the patient is at the center making decisions. There isn't substituted decision-making. Physical exercises, professionalism in approach, proper follow-up, and then there may be specific treatments like parenting skills, sleep hygiene, treatments for hyperventilation, et cetera. Um, prescribing, uh, now this depends, when we're doing a training, this might depend on whether we've got prescribers or not. But we know that uh, there's a lot of errors made in prescribing these days. There's a lot of medicines that are used in mental health that are not really appropriate. So um, we want in essential care and practice, we cover safe prescribing and working collaboratively with the patient. Uh, master chart is an overview of the various conditions in MHGAP. And this is just, I'm just giving you a quick picture of what a, the module on depression looks like. It has assessment, management, and follow-up. And it has these various flow diagrams, uh, which are match ICD and various protocols. There's a humanitarian version, the HIG, uh, there's other associated tools, Problem Management Plus, which has, for example, been used in Pakistan. Thinking healthy for perinatal conditions. Um, now, just to give a little bit of examples of MHGAP programs, I've mentioned Syria, uh, where we had some training, and that's rolled out very well, considering all the difficulties there. We've had programs in, MA, in Sierra Leone during the Ebola epidemic. Uh, we've had a lot of MHGAP uh, work in, with the Rohingya in Bangladesh and supervision. Pakistan, we've done MHGAP training here as well. Um, and uh, 
this is some uh, this just to give you a flavor of what the trainings can be like, which are very much around role plays and interactive um, uh, teaching. Uh, this is KP, I think. Uh, so we've rolled it out to most of the, just about all the uh, provinces of Pakistan. Myanmar is another example that we've been, uh, we're still working in for MHGAP even with the current difficulties, uh, which face a big, cause a big challenge. But we have done some evaluation work in uh, Myanmar, which has shown that um, there is uh, definite ongoing benefits of the MHGAP program. From COVID, with COVID-19, uh, everything has gone online for us. So myself, I've been involved in work in the Middle East, um, some wider area, wider countries with International Medical Corps. And uh, there's the PAHO, the Americas Online Forum. Um, this is what our online training can look like. And it really, I think what we can see is, although it's not as, as good as face-to-face, uh, -face, it can be done. Uh, supervision is something that I've, is really, really important for MHGAP. And, um, We've been, uh, for myself, I'm supervising people in many different countries at the moment in different groups. This is a recent uh, supervision session I had with uh, Kakuma Camp in uh, Kenya near, near the Somali border. Evaluation. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done on evaluation and actual how it impacts on patient care. Um, it's... There's a lot of work done on trainings and the improvement of trainings. Uh, Myanmar, we've done some work long for long, longer term evaluation, but still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so evaluation has looked at uh, research, economic ad uh, trainings, clinical applications. Uh, most evaluations have been done in Africa and Asia. Uh, and it does so general positive effects on patient care, uh, research and practice, um, but there still is that gap in looking at what is the overall patient impact. Uh, health workers, we know they have more knowledge and skills, more confidence, uh, improved job satisfaction, improved diagnostic skills. Patients use services more, they improve clinically, return to work, face less stigma. But obstacles that have come that have been looked at in evaluation are funding, supervision, support for training, cultural factors, time constraints, um, the leadership, uh, availability of medication. I'm just going to uh, mention just one thing that we've developed in the College of Psychiatrists, which we'll hope to publish. Is our, is our toolkit from our special interest group of the college, uh, where we have manualized some of the treatments that are, are covered are in uh, MHGAP, like psychoeducation, problem solving, um, motivational interviewing, parenting skills, psychological first aid. And we've highlighted as well here that hand technique, which is one psychosocial technique which takes, brings in social mobilization, behavioral activation, and some aspects of cognitive therapy with messages of hope. Uh, this is a clinical technique um, that we found really, really helpful and complements the MH gap. Uh, self care is always something that's very important when we look at MH gap and uh, recognizing that working in in health can be so can be very stressful uh, and this is in mh gap and in psychological first aid another thing i will just mention briefly is that we've been looking at pre-service training this means putting in mh gap into your undergraduate curriculum for medicine or nursing and many several countries have um have been doing this and with good um, good effects. There's resistance, of course, uh, because it may not be quite as academic, but from a public health point of view, 
training people, um, nurses and doctors to manage common mental health problems at a basic level makes a lot of sense. Um, we need to still further, further evaluate this and see if it's sustainable, but results have generally been positive. Uh, where MHGAP goes wrong, I would say is um, there's not enough planning and organization to keep it going. There's a lack of medicine supply. There's lack of supervision. The psychiatrists may not be comfortable with it, can be an issue sometimes because they're a key part of the system referring backwards and forwards. Uh, so my own reflections on MH Gap over this past 10 years I've been involved is that it's more than just a training. It's more than a week's training. It's about supervision long term. It's about an approach to mental health. It's public mental health. Um, and it's really you need to put energy into it to keep it going. And you'll get the messages saying we don't have time. Uh, we're too busy, we can't use a book in front of us. All of those are surmountable. You can do a lot in a short period of time and uh, you can get over referring to a book quite easily. So my message is um, there's a huge burden of mental health problems in the world and it's growing. With COVID, we see an increase as well. Uh, we MH gap is one useful tool to deal with this. Stigma and discrimination is common. MH gap can be helpful here. And you can effectively manage common mental health problems in a non specialized healthcare setting, reducing stigma and discrimination. MH gap provides the basic skills to identify and manage these conditions in consultation with specialists. I think that's always an important caveat. You do need expertise around you. So thank you very much uh, for, for this, uh, which was a brief run through MH Gap and uh, reflections, evaluations. Um, and I have put at the end of the slide some of the references that I've referred to uh, during this presentation. So thank you for uh, your time and thank you very much.